Hamatakyapi, Napi Chuzapi, Chante Washte. I want to greet each and one of you with a good heart and a handshake. Um, my name is Nick Estes. I, as Alexis had so generously said, I'm from the Lower Brosu tribe or the Kui Chashu Yate. And today I want to talk about what it means to be a water protector and why the identity of a water protector in this era of climate chaos is so important to a future on this planet, but also a different way of living with the earth. In this photo, this is a wild rice field in northern Minnesota in Anishinaabe and Dakota territory. As you can see, this field has suffered a drought. Um, normally, as you can see on the right-hand side of this photo, the water is at a level um, that is much higher than it currently is. And this was taken last year during the height of the Line 3 struggle to stop the Line 3 uh, tar sands pipeline from going through Dakota and Anishinaabe territory. And my guide that day was Jamie Arsenal, who is from the White Earth Reservation. And what she was showing me in, the, in this photo uh, was the harvest that her family got in a single day. And normally, she said, that they got about 80 pounds of wild rice, or manoman, as they call it in Anishinaabe, a day. And this is what she harvested that day. It was about a cup, or half a cup, of, of wild rice. Uh, and just to the right of the frame, east of where we're standing, the Line 3 pipeline uh, was being constructed. And this drought and this damage to this rice bed wasn't the result of the Line 3 pipeline. It was the result of cumulative climate change, of carbon emissions that had happened generations before. And so even while water protectors, such as the Ginu Collective in northern Minnesota, were attaching themselves to heavy machinery and getting arrested and brutalized um, by sheriff's deputies from Minnesota, climate change was already taking effect. You can't see it in this photo, but there were wildfire smoke that was blowing in from Canada at this particular time. So it was fighting for a future in a present that was already apocalyptic. This is a map that shows the route of the Line 3 pipeline through these delicate ecosystems. And I think it's important to point out that while there's a lot of talk about how indigenous struggles are attached to the land and how we have an earth-centered and earth-based knowledge system, which is all true, there's often a tendency to not fully understand traditional economies. They're not historic, and so maybe traditional isn't the correct term, but maybe they're just land-based economies that aren't entirely capitalistic. And so, for example, going back to Jamie Arsenal's story about her connection to that, that rice bed, sure, Anishinaabe people have an esoteric spiritual connection to Monoman, which is codified within their 1855 treaty that actually protects the right of Monoman to exist. It's the only grain that is protected by treaty rights, by indigenous treaty rights, which isn't necessarily an aberration because Article 11 of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which was signed by my nation, the Ocheti Shakoni, the Lakota Nation, and the Dakota Nations, also set aside territory for the continued per perpetuation of the Pteo Yate, or the Buffalo Nation, or the Buffalo people. And so even within these colonial treaties, these colonial laws, we inserted our rights of our relatives to exist and continue to, continue to exist. We know today Western societies have adopted the rights of nature movement. Um, and this is being you know, attacked by the right as an anti-human and anti-life movement as well. Uh, and we can see the recent successes of certain countries like Ecuador, 
and Bolivia and codifying it within their constitutional frameworks or within legal systems to protect Mother Earth or Pachamama. <clears throat> I also want to talk about the effectiveness of these kinds of Earth-centered and Earth-based approaches to fighting climate change and climate justice. Because too often our jobs, such as those within the oil industry, pitted against indigenous rights. It's important to look again back at what Jamie Arsenault was showing me that day, that her family depended on a seasonal economy, a seasonal economy that depended on rice harvesting, right? One that was not entirely imbricated within the capitalist system, but nonetheless provided sustenance. Where was the question of jobs when it came to the destruction of rice paddies? Where was the, the discussion of green jobs when it comes to land defense? Typically, jobs as we know them in a capitalist system is often workers in relationship to capital. And oftentimes our jobs entail acts of pollution. And in the case of these pipelines, whether it was the Dakota Access Pipeline, the proposed Keystone XL Pipeline, or the Line 3 Pipeline, which was essentially a reroute of the Keystone XL Pipeline carrying the same tar sands, the question of unionized labor always came to the fore and the jobs that were going to be provided. And when these indigenous nations, whether at Standing Rock or whether at the Line 3 protests decided to set up blockades and to say these pipelines will not only destroy our water systems, but they will destroy our economies. Unionized pipeline workers crossed a picket line. What do we call people who cross picket lines? We call them scabs. <laughs> and in this era of growing, intensifying, organized, labor militancy, we have to understand that indigenous lifeways, indigenous uh, protection of water, of air, of land, that we, the very sustenance that we need to survive should also be considered a form of labor that is valued and protected. So as you can see from this, this map, which is a map that comes from the Indigenous Environmental Network and Oil Change International report that documents 26 frontline fights against fossil fuel infrastructure and extraction. That report, which was issued last year, uh, last fall, found that Indigenous-led movements from a variety of struggles, whether it was through direct action, court cases, legislation, were challenging about a quarter of greenhouse emissions from both Canada and the United States. In other words, indigenous people, a minority within both settler states, are punching well above their weight line, or their weight class in terms of impact on climate change and preventing cataclysmic climate catastrophe. To put that into perspective, that's about 400 new coal-fired power plants that are being challenged. And just the Line 3 pipeline alone is about 50 coal-fired power plants. So the completion of the Line 3 pipeline and the carbon emissions that it will produce over its lifetime are about the equivalent of 50 coal-fired power plants. That's more than twice the carbon emissions of the entire state of Minnesota. And so we have to ask our so-called climate leaders in the Biden administration, in the Minnesota government, how is it that in this era of catastrophic climate change, are they building these kinds of pipelines? I also want to turn to a recent backlash against water protectors, and against the climate justice movement. Uh, there was last December a legislative initiative led by the, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council um, called 
Ener the Energy Discrimination Elimination Act, which is model legislation that'll go through, that it's planned to go through state legislators to ban and to make illegal the divestment from fossil fuel companies as a form of energy discrimination. The journalist Kay Arnoff, who also spoke at this conference, termed this initiative critical energy theory. <laughs> because the proponents of this particular backlash legislation call the divestment of financial institutions, banks, governments, universities, a form of quote unquote woke capitalism. And we have to ask ourselves, how is it that the term woke from 2016 to the present has now become wholly identified with a derogatory sentiment? A term that was theorized and thought about and trafficked through the Black Lives Matter movement by black people on the streets calling for the end of police violence and extrajudicial killings of black people. How is it that both parties, both liberals and conservatives in this country have taken a term that meant racial justice and turned it into something derogatory? So we have to think about this backlash that is happening, not only in terms of the backlash on critical race theory, but also critical energy theory now, but also the effectiveness of these movements. If you're challenging a quarter of greenhouse emissions from both Canada and the United States against one of the most violent and destructive industries in human history, of course there's gonna be back backlash. Of course there's going to be punishment and revenge against those who have hit the bottom line of this capitalist society. But I don't want to leave you with a pessimistic message because I think in this time we need hope. I think we need answers. We need direction in terms of where we're going. And one of the things that we've talked about in the Red Deal, which is a manifesto that, I, that we helped uh, co-write uh, with the Red Nation, it's a collective manifesto that was inspired by the 2010 People's Accords of, of Cochabamba, which in our opinion uh, was one of the most revolutionary climate documents to be written, drafted, and attempted to be implemented in our, in our lifetime. We have things such as the Green New Deal. I think the sentiments behind such endeavors are important, but what the Cochabamba Accords or the People's Accords put forward is a critique not only of the patriarchal capitalist system that commodifies nature and that commodifies relations between humans and the non-human world, but also the uneven expectations of transition that are outsourced oftentimes to indigenous people and those people of the global south. That if global south countries, nations, and peoples developed along the same pathway as those in the United States and the, the so-called first world, we would need three planets to exist. We would need three planets to survive the immense amount of resources that it's gonna take. And we can see that same mentality, that same system operating today when the United States wants to make a one-to-one -one transition of energy consumption without understanding the extractive relationship it has to continue to consume. The lithium, the copper, the cobalt that goes into renewable technologies has to come from somewhere. Whether it was Biden, whether it was Trump, they understood that the key trading partner in that particular energy transition, the so-called green revolution, was China. And much like the, the fracking boom that began in 2008, which was an attempt to wean the United States off of what it considered conflict oil from countries that it was in disagreement with, the United States is again trying to develop its own strategic mineral reserve for green technology. Rather than questioning 
the mass consumption of energy in the first place. And we can see that indigenous peoples, again, are on the chopping block. Whether it is Resolution Copper in the sacred site of Oak Flat, to build one of the world's largest copper mines to fill the needs of the so-called green energy revolution, or whether the massive open pit lithium mine that they're trying to build in Nevada, Thacker Pass, on sacred Northern Paiute lands, we understand that this relationship is still fundamentally colonial and we need an alternative. And so that's why we're saying we need a people's agreement, not only amongst human nations and relations, but we need a people's agreement with the earth itself. And that we draw inspiration from, Vir, from Bevere Buen, or the idea that living and development in correct relations doesn't mean overconsumption, doesn't mean that we measure our successes on material consumption, but we measure our successes on the quality of life, not only of human beings, whether it's housing, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, or whether it's just living a good life, not at the expense of the planet. And we have models to draw from, as I pointed out with Bolivia, uh, with Ecuador, but now there are growing models here in the United States. We have to go back to the water protectors. There's a reason why we are living in the era of the water protector. For sure, water protection, the defense of land, the defense of non-human species and relatives has existed since time immemorial, but there was something different about 2016 where anyone, not just indigenous people, could walk through the gates at the Ocheti Shakoni camp in Standing Rock and become a water protector. It's a universal identity that's grounded in indigenous values. And we need support for those who have sacrificed their freedom, indigenous and non-indigenous. Over 900 water protectors in the Line 3 struggle are going through the court systems right now. And I want all of you to go online, to go to dropline3charges.com, to donate, to find out how you can support the legal defense, because the most ethical thing that you can do right now is direct action. The most ethical thing that you can do in this particular moment in time is to support those who are putting their bodies on the line. Because as my mentor and my relative, Madonna Thunderhawk, told me that it's the highest honor of a Lakota person to be an ancestor of the future. And that's what we're asking you in this moment in time, to be good relatives of the future generations. So thank you very much.